it is your first time to uh, the Father's house, we want to say welcome. I want to give a mad love and shout out to our digital online community as well as our Norco Prison Campus. Can we just give a little shout out, some love? Oh, it is a great day to be in the house of God. Uh, before we even get started, let me just tell you that like I missed you, like legit, legit, legit. Uh, Matt and I had a, 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 an opportunity to go to Liverpool, England and do some ministry work there. And so last week we were not here as we were serving, but um, if you know anything about me, you know that I'm like obsessed with accents. And so in addition to like serving the Lord and worshiping God, I was like listening to like their intonation, their phrases, and I was like, I'm gonna master this accent. And so I've come all the way from Liverpool to tell you how much I love you and you dirty scouses. I'm glad you're in church and you can be like a Liverpool bird, all right? And so my accent was so good. They said, oh, you really sound like us. And so I just wanna let you know, I'm very proud of that fact. In addition to me being proud of being able to work on my accents, I am so proud to take the message of what God is doing here at TFHOC across the globe and share his faithfulness about your faithfulness to the house. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, one of the nights that Matt and I, uh, we landed, we were feeling a little jet lagged. And so we told the pastors like, hey, we're going to kind of stay local. And that night in the freezing cold, uh, we held hands and we walked the cold streets of Liverpool. And if you know anything about me and my love for music, in Liverpool is where the Beatles originated. So as I'm holding Matt's hand, I am serenading him and singing to him repeatedly, I want to hold your hand. I want to hold your hand. I want to hold your hand. Um, he was not amused by that at all. But we finally made it to 11 Matthew Street. And 11 Matthew Street is cat club where the Beatles were actually discovered. And I love that they have had this indelible mark on American music um, that has impacted generations. Uh, one of my favorite songs, the lyrics say this, uh, but you can learn to be you in time. It's easy. All you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love, love, love. Love is all you need. And though this song was not written for believers or by believers, I believe that they were on to something. In fact, these lyrics have haunted me all week. And I'm asking myself the question, is love all that you need? This whole series, as we kick off this first week, is called Love Is. And it is going to walk us through to have a better way to do relationships. Over the next five weeks, we want to kind of unpack what it is to learn what love is and how to love well. And we can't do this until we know the love of God. So from friendships to dating to marriage, like we need to get this absolutely right. In fact, we have been created for community. We've been created to do life in community. So much so that our good God is in community himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And in the creation of man, in the creation of mankind, the beginning of a creation story, the first thing that God said wasn't good was that man was alone. See, so everyone wants to be in relationship. It is a core fundamental uh, desire to be in relationship, but we don't know how. And here is the absolute truth. We cannot be successful in relationships if we do not understand what love is. So in this series, we're going to be discussing dating, marriage, friendship, conflict, and it will center around this idea of learning to love. So if you're married and we happen to be speaking about dating, I don't want you to be like, well, dating's not for me. It's fine. I'm over that. It, dating doesn't stop after you say I do. And if it did, you might have some problems in your marriage. So take note, okay? In addition to this, maybe you're married and you have lost the sensitivity of so many singles and the plight of feeling alone in a society that values relationship. What would it look like for you to be able to have language to communicate with someone who's in a season of singleness? And maybe if you are single, sexy, and sanctified, and you are waiting to get married, I think it's important that you take note because we, I love marriage. Marriage is fun. Marriage is good. Marriage is awesome. But marriage is hard. And marriage takes a heck of a lot of work. And Matt and I do not ever have divorce on our lips, but we do discuss murder quite often. <laughs> so wherever you are in this spectrum, whether you are singled, widowed, divorced, or married, we are all going to be in relationship with someone. And the greatest gift that you can give someone isn't your wealth, your influence, your social status. The greatest gift that you can give someone is the gift of love. 
So if you're a note taker, pull out your Bibles and your journals, your iPhones, your iPads, and begin to take note. The title of today's message is, What is Love? Now, this concept, this problem, this issue, this problema has not just been a modern day issue. This has plagued us since the beginning of time. In fact, Paul the apostle, when he wrote to the Corinthian church, he was not only writing to church plants much like ours, but he was writing not just to the church at Corinth, hence Corinthians. He's not just writing to the church of, uh, of, of Ephesus, like the letter in Ephesians, or the church of Philippi, hence the Philippians. There is one thread that you see in all of these epistles, that means his letters. There's just one thread, and that one thread is he is obsessed with not just talking about God's love, but how he is saying it is a necessary ingredient for their community a necessary com ingredient for their community. In fact, my fear is that we've allowed the media to hijack this idea of relationships and this idea of love. The world should look at us and say, wait a minute, you guys are still married after 20 years? Wait a minute, wait a minute, you guys are dating and abstaining from uh, sexual intimacy before marriage? Oh wait, you guys were dating and you broke up and yet you're still friends at church? What if we set the bar of what healthy relationships look like? What if the world came to us and said, wait a minute, you guys are onto something. Yeah, his name is Jesus and he's teaching us how to love. So all throughout the letters that Paul writes, his epistles, he's basically saying, love people and love God. Love God and love people. So if he was, a man from Liverpool in 1964 with a weird bowl haircut, he would have been great with the Beatles. He's basically saying, all you need is love. All you need is love, love, love. Love is all you need. In chapter 12, the chapter before where we're going to anchor uh, this series in, Paul lists these amazing spiritual gifts. He says, hey, some of you guys are called to be teachers. Some of you guys are called to be prophets. Some of you guys are called to be pastors. Some of you also have the gift of faith. But then he says, and all of that is for naught if you do not have love. In fact, the very last verse of chapter 12, it says this, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Here's the reality, friends. We need the most excellent way. I don't know about you, but I got some issues that I need to address and hang on. In fact, I know that I'm not alone because statistically speaking, we have in our generation more friends, fans, and followers than any generation before. No, at no point in any other generation can you pop online and be connected to 300 followers that you have instant access with. And yet, how many of us that are on digital media feel isolated, alone, disconnected, and depressed? If statistics are true, one in two marriages will end in divorce. If statistics are true, most marriages end at year seven. And maybe you're walking through a divorce right now and you are wrecked with pain. In fact, the national average is the seven year itch, but here in Orange County, it's three years. 68% of men say that they don't know how to ask a woman out. That should shock you guys, come on. You're like, oh, I don't know how I should respond to that. All the single ladies are like, it's about time, girl. Talk about it, okay? So if 68% of men don't know how to ask a woman out, do you know that the average percentage of unmarried people living in America is 63%? Yo, there's a correlation, okay? Uh, if, if we are struggling in our friendships, we are struggling to keep friends or make friends, it could be because we've turned to digital to satiate a fake reality of community. And speaking of digital, instead of focusing on fostering sexual intimacy in a committed relationship, we are going to pornography to satiate these needs. Yeah. And these statistics, they're not meant to bring shame. They are signs and symptoms of letting us know something's not right. That's what we are going after in this series. Um, as a purveyor of culture, I'm obsessed with pop culture. I love the crossroads between like culture and Christianity and how we respond in light of culture and what is changing. And I love love. Like I'm obsessed with love. I want to be up in your business. I want you to spill the tea. I want to know who has what. I want to know if you're married. I want to know if you're single. I want to know if you're shacking up. I want to know it all, okay? And I have been obsessed with this, not just because I'm nosy, but I have been obsessed with this, with looking at relationships to see how it ticks, to see how it works, and what's the secret of a sustaining relationship. 
Now, from Dr. Phil to Dr. Ruth to Dr. Laura, I've watched their educated, learned, intellectual wisdom on relationships. But I'm asking the same questions. Who defines love? How does it play out in culture? And why is love and relationships so stinking hard? Uh, my uh, research is not all educational, though. Um, Matt says that I have taste in trashy television. I call it research, okay? <laughs> Get on my page. So whether it is Netflix's number one trending show right now, Love is Blind, or whether it is The Bachelor, Bachelor at Empire for the last 17 years, whether it's 90 Day Fiance or Millionaire Matchmaker, you guys, I have been a voyeur into the lives of people and wondering what is the secret sauce to long-lasting relationships. But God was the missing part. I remember this isn't something that like, I wanted to investigate while I was single. I'm married and what I've discovered is even after being married, I have this wild fascination of relationships and what is the bond of perfection? What is that thing that brings people together? And as a single person, I think I started researching and falling in love with it because I got tired of Friday and Saturday nights chilling with my two friends, Ben and Jerry, you know? <laughs> I think it's real, all real quick, but Ben and Jerry are way better than Johnny and Jose, if you know what I mean, okay? So no judgment, no, no, no. Now, I am not a love expert. I'm not a paid professional. I don't get paid to be a pastor. I don't get paid to, be a pa to, to teach on love. I'm not a love doctor. But you know what I've discovered in all the research and the books and the shows that I've read and watched is no one ever defines what love is. Dr. Phil, Patty Stegner, the millionaire matchmaker, Chris Harrison from The Bachelor, not once have they ever described what love is. And as we kick off the love series, uh, this foundational passage that we're about to go through not only defines love, but it does so by describing love. Paul uh, wrote to this early church, this baby church, much like us, and he's like, I'm gonna give you some wisdom. So pull out your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're gonna start in verse four, and I wanna go through this and excavate Paul's understanding of love. He says this, love is patient. Love is not rushed. It says love is kind. That's, love should be tender and sweet, guys. Uh, love does not envy, it, it's not jealous. It does not boast, it is not proud. Basically, y'all catch that, love is humble. Love does not dishonor and it is not self-seeking. It doesn't think uh, of, of themselves, it thinks of others. Love is not easily angered and love keeps no record of wrong. Basically, love is not a bone collector, if you know what I'm saying. Love does not delight in evil, but love rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Verse eight, love never fails. Now, Paul gives us 16 characteristics. It's like a matrix, a rubric, a bar of what the standard of love is. And all those descriptions and all those definitions might feel like a lot, like, wait a minute, uh, that's love? I gotta I, I got do all that? But listen, you don't even know the half of it, okay? Because what Paul is talking about here isn't just this generic word of love. In fact, the word that he uses there for love is different. Why? Um, our American English is very limited. So if you were to say, I love my mom, I love McDonald's, I love my dog, I love my friend, we have to decipher which one do you love more? But see, for the Greeks, they had language around that. There's four words that they use for Greek, if, or for the Greek word for love. And if you're taking note, write this down. The first word is eros. We get our English word erotic, for, erotic from this word. So it is the passionate, the hot, the sexual love. And if you've gone to churches that say this is a wrong type of love, they're misunderstanding the word of God. God is not up in heaven looking at people having sex saying, oh no, what are they doing? He invented it, he condones it. He's like, yes, baby boo, get yours in the context of marriage, okay? In the context of marriage. This is the type of love like the lyric from Salt and Pepper. Baby, you so crazy, I think I wanna have your baby, okay? That's, that's 
the eros love. The second type of love is phileo for masculine or philia for feminine. And this is the friendship love, the friendship love. Uh, the next one is storge, that's the familial love. That's the love between a mom and a dad or a grandparent and a grandchild. It's that kind of love. And the last one is agape. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on agape because agape love is a love that is unchanging. It is a self-giving love with zero expectation of receiving anything back. It is a love so great that it can love the unlovable, the unwanted, and the unappealing. It is a love that gives and not want anything in return. It is a love that is painful. In fact, we get our word agony from the Greek word agape because it is a love that will go through pain because I love you. It's a, that kind of love. That's God's agape love. So you feel like you got that, right? See, I want to make sure though, because my fear is that we come in and we get to information and we leave like, oh, I got some great information. I know the Greek word, but I want information to become transformational revelation. Okay. I want you to know if you are feeling lusty and dusty and musty and you're craving someone, that's an eros love. Okay. If you have met someone and you have a connection with them, that is a phileo love. Now I want to make sure uh, that we understand this. So get ready Bible scholars, because you are about to have a pop quiz. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to play a clip of music and then you're going to tell me what Greek word of love this is, okay? So I'm going to play a clip of music and I'm going to put the four Greek words up and then you got to holler back what that love is. Are you ready to play? Yes. DJ, hit me with the first song. Why do you know that song, church? I'll pray for you, okay? Somebody holler back and tell me what love that is. Oh, okay. You're like, I love that one. Hey. Some of y'all had a flesh flash right now. You're like, Jesus, forgive me. I'm so sorry. Okay. Good job. You got one point. DJ, hit me with the next one. Hey. You got to put it on your friends, right? Yeah. All right, guys. All right. All right. What Greek word is this? Good, we get our English word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love from this word. Okay, next one. With a little bit of a sway. Okay, what love is this? And the last one by default and by definition is an agape love. It is a love that gives and wants nothing in return. It is a love that should wrap you in and take you to a place emotionally. So when you hear this song, I want you to feel the love of God overwhelm you. definition that Paul is giving us here is agape. And the problem with this definition is, is that the expectation of loving someone like this is so incredibly hard. Not only is it hard to do, not only is it sacrificial, not only does it take time and is it consuming, it stands in direct opposition to the love that we see today in 2020. That's not the love that we see. That's not the love that we value. In fact, um, I want to kind of reformat the language. I want to change the language to give us an understanding of how many of us understand and interpret love in 2020. On the screen, it's the 2020 version of this passage. Love is rushed. Hurry up, come on. Love is rude. I got time for that. Love is jealous and catty. Let me see your DMs. It brags and it boasts. It's showy and proud. Oh, look at my handbag. She's so fly, got a dime. No, 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 stop. Love is about self-gratifying your needs and it's all about you. It's easily triggered and it is petty. Love loves to spill the tea and knows nothing that is, and knows nothing is sacred or private. Love is a hit it and quit it, self-preserving and is suspect of trusting anyone. Love is fleeting. That's how we understand love today. We've got a problem. We all want to be loved. We all want to be seen. We all want to be known. 
If we haven't received the love of God, we are never going to genuinely be able to love someone else. Why? Because we can't give what we do not have. We can't give what we don't have. And we struggle to love ourselves and love others because we don't know this love of God, this agape love of God. And I see so many people walking around frustrated and trying to give and receive love when they've never experienced a true sense of love. I'm gonna go as far as saying this, that I don't believe you will ever be able to feel loved or receive love in a way that makes you feel whole until you experience the good love of God. And I'm not saying this because I've got this figured out. In fact, in light of studying and putting together this message this week, I've realized, I thought at one point, oh, I'm good at love. I'm good at loving people. I honestly did. I have a whole prison initiative called In the Name of Love. I really did think I was good at this. And then I'm studying God's word and I'm realizing I actually suck at this. And in light of God's word, I don't have condemnation. I'm challenged to change. I began to pray, God, may your agape love complete me. May your love heal me. May your love restore me. May your love renew me. May your love correct me. May your love change me. May your love renew me and rename me. That's what I want us to hear today as we kick off. Now, because we can't go where we've never been and what we can't see, we need to discuss, discuss uh, what love is and our response to this love. So Paul lays out what love is, but and he does so in very uh, simplistic terms, but I want us to see a response to this love. So turn with me, go to the right uh, in your Bible, uh, to almost the very last of your Bible, to a book called 1 John. And as you turn there in 1 John chapter 4, that's where we're going to be. This is one of the books written by John, the disciple John, who was a follower of Jesus. In fact, he had a nickname. Does anyone know his nickname? John the Beloved. And he was the one that loved really, really well. And we see that um, in later years of his life, he was looking back and talking about the number one thing that weighed on his heart, and that was the love of God. So if Paul, we just read in 1 Corinthians 13, if Paul gives us 16 uh, principles to describe what love is, John is going to give us how to respond to this love. Turn with me to verse, uh, verse 7 of chapter 4. He says this, Dear brothers and sisters of the Father's house, Orange County, let us love one another, for love comes from who, church? God. Everyone who has been born of God, everyone who loves has been born of God. Whoever does not love does not know who, church? God. Because God is what, church? Love. In one verse, he uses this word agape, love, five different times. What does this have to do with you? Everything. This has everything to do with you because most of us long to be loved, but we don't know how to get it. And some of us in here are, are, are trying to give your love to other people, but it's almost like you're sabotaging your own methods because you're giving something you've never experienced. And maybe some of us in this room are just so done with relationships and done with love that you'd rather just be a nun uh, or a hermit in a cloister up no, surrounded by no one. So let me give you three responses to this agape love. In chapter four, we see that John, if you're taking note, he teaches us, we respond when we receive his love. We respond when we receive his love. When you encounter this love, this genuine, real, awesome love, you cannot help but share this love with everyone. If you got invited here by a friend, a coworker, a cousin, a friend, an ex-lover, you should thank them and say, thank you for loving me. Let me tell you why. John says this in 1 John 4, 11, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. My dad, uh, he, he's a pastor, uh, but he didn't teach me love from a biblical perspective. He showed me love by how he lived his life. He's a good man, a good man. Uh, but I remember vividly when my mom was diagnosed uh, with a terminal illness and she was given a 
percent chance of living. In that season, it was really difficult, but I saw my father love my mother so well. Uh, the chemotherapy was wreaking havoc on her body and she was experiencing uh, motor functions and inability to control bodily functions. I, I remember she was holding a cup and she had lost her ability to grasp things and the cup, a bowl, a plate would fall out and contents would spill on the floor. I remember she was losing ability to stand on her feet and so there would be times where she would just stumble to the floor or have to quickly find a seat. But one of the most traumatic moments was when my mom was in the kitchen and uh, she lost control of bodily function and she defecated on herself. She was mortified and as she was heading to the bathroom, she lost control of her legs and she ended up on the floor. My dad walked in. saw his wife of 25 years on the floor crying. And she wasn't crying because she was in pain. She was crying because she was embarrassed. My dad scooped her up in his arms and took her to the bathroom and bathed my mother until she was clean. And he said, how can I not love my wife if God has scooped me up for my drunken stupor and my drug binges and loved me? How can I not love others? And the truth is, is so when we experience the love of God, we cannot help but share this with other people. And this leads to another thing that we learn that John teaches us out of the same chapter in verse 16. He says, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us. So point number two, when you live close to God, your love increases. The closer you are to God, the closer that you are to loving others well. Let me prove this to you. Um, when you live close to, to God, you find yourself with an explosive capacity to love others. The disciples, the word disciple means student. So the students of Jesus, they who follow Jesus, guess what? They begin to act like him. They begin to love him. They begin to find themselves. I'm so sorry, I'm spitting. Ashley, if you get baptized today, all service, guys. I see it and I'm feeling very self-conscious. So you got baptized for the second time, Ashley. Congratulations, great. When we live close to God, it affects how we interact with others. And if you're sitting here thinking like, I, I don't come to church. When you say get close to God, what does that mean? Guess what? The Bible is considered his love letter to us. You wanna get, get to know God? Will you find yourself scouring the pages of scripture? And if you're like, I don't even know where to begin. I don't have a lot of time. Give me five minutes. Give me 30 seconds of praying. Give me four minutes of reading God's word and give me 30 seconds of praying at the end. Five minutes, give me the first five minutes of your day and I will tell you that your life will change. Read Psalms, read the book of John, begin to see how much God loves you. And when you see God love you, you'll begin to be woke to the fact that I need to change. I don't like the person I am. I thank God for counseling, thank God for, care, for, for therapy, but I'm getting re revelation out of the word of God of how to change me. And here's the thing, there is nothing stopping you from entering into a relationship with God. He's willing, he's able, he's hungry. He wants to be in a relationship with you. He's like, my arms are wide open, come to me. You got issues, I got tissues, boo. I have got your back. And this is not complicated. He's saying, hey, I wanna hang out with you. Let me prove this in Revelation 3.20. It says this, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will. Not I might, not, well, if you're lucky. Not, well, if you get your act together. No, he said, I will come in. The last point that we see here is we love because he first loved us. And what John revealed to us 2000 years ago is that we love because he first loved us. We cannot give what we don't have, but when we get in relationship with God, we grow in that love and we become better at loving people. Look at 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. And here at TFHOC, I don't wanna be like culture, which just pontificates about what love is. I want it to be demonstrated. I don't want you to come in here and know how to parse out scripture and know what that Greek word means. No, I want your life to change. And I saw this played out in the life of one woman who will forever be part of our TFHOC family. Her name is Sue Ann Denson. And I met Sue Ann because I was speaking at a conference that was uh, televised online and she happened to see it. And she said, wait a minute, where's this church? She Googled the church and discovered there wasn't too far from her home. She lived in LA. 
And on a Sunday, her husband said, I'm not gonna go to church. And she came to church by herself. She was bold and she was brazen and coming on her own. But when she pulled into the parking lot, she felt an overwhelming sense of anxiety. And maybe you came on your own or maybe you were invited and you were like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Why is everyone high-fiving me? This is really weird. I I just wanna let you know that in the presence of God, your life can change because that's what happened to Sue Ann. We discovered that when she came out of her car, the, uh, the, uh, the parking lot attendants had gently encouraged her to go over to the welcoming team where they had high-fived her like 85 times and she came in and she said, I feel seen and I feel genuinely welcomed. In her season of life, she felt frustrated in marriage. She felt like she was failing in love and she was floundering in her faith until she found community here at TFH. Uh, Sue Ann has been married for over 10 years to her husband, but they've been unable to conceive. She, had, uh, she has PCOS, that's polycystic ovarian syndrome, and has been not been able to conceive since the time they've been together. In September at our pursuit night, which is our monthly worship night, I I had an overwhelming sense where I just wanted to, in that moment, I wanted to hear, God, what do you have for your people? And I felt like we needed to specifically pray for women that were suffering with issues with, with their ovaries. And so I just popped up and I said, hey, I just feel like we need to pray for people in here who are having issues and their ovaries and we're gonna pray that God heals you. She heard that and she was like, well, that's not for me because I've had PCOS for 10 years. And then she caught herself and said, well, God, if you wanna heal me, like, okay. She continued to plug herself in here. And at that time we were going to two services and she started to feel a little conviction because she was coming here and involved, uh, but she'd never been involved. And she's just like, well, I, I, I should help out because I know that they need help. And so she connected with Chloe, our kids pastor. And she said, hey, I just, I feel like I, I, I need to hold babies and I'm here to help. Side note, if you feel called to children's ministry, sign up, okay? We need so much help. Don't come if you are crazy because we fingerprint everyone, but like come volunteer. Well, she was holding babies and loving God and getting connected in community. And then that's when the shoe dropped. Her husband who serves in the military had got reassigned to Colorado and she was angry. She was upset. She said, I just found my pace. I just found my community. I just found my friends and now I have to leave. But this woman had been experiencing a transformation in her heart. God began to chip away at some of the callous pieces of her heart that she was resenting with her husband. And yet she knew I I have to be with my husband. I'm gonna go with him to Colorado. But he was a good man. He said, hey, I, I see what's going on at that church. You know, like I'll fly you out once a month that you can go and be with your church friends. A good husband. Yeah, if you see her, bless her, high five her. She was in Colorado and she's working at this new job and she was joking around with her coworkers and she, she just hasn't been feeling well. And she thought it was because of the elevation difference between here in Colorado until one of her coworkers jokingly said, well, maybe you're pregnant. And she laughed until she went and bought a pregnancy test on her way home from work. Well the pregnancy test was positive. And she said, no, this is a mistake. So she took four more and they were all positive. And she realized I'm pregnant. Let me tell you something. I believe that in her faithfulness, God began to move in her heart. The baby is due in July, just nine months after pursuit where we prayed for ovaries. And this is what I believe. This is what I believe. I believe that this baby is gonna bring her daddy to faith. Why? Because it was her mom. Her mom had experienced the love of God that allowed her to love her father and her community so well that this baby is gonna bring this family together. So what is love? Paul preaches this so beautifully for us. He says, love is patient, love is kind, love doesn't envy, love does not boast, love is not proud. So we know what love looks like, but we, Do we know who love is? Because Jesus didn't pontificate about the points of love. Jesus demonstrated this. He demonstrated this on a cross on Calvary with his arms stretched out, held up by spikes. And as the ticket, the the seconds of his life are ticking by and his breath is shallowed and he's in pain and his face, scripture says his visage is marred. His face was so beaten, he was unrecognizable. He was whipped for our sins. He was scourged for our mistakes. He hung on a cross in shame. And he thought of you, the businessman. He thought of you, the single mom. He thought of you, 
you the lonely girl. He thought of you the addict. He thought of you the drug lord. He thought of you the student. He thought of you the girl with a broken marriage, the guy who's addicted to pornography. He stretched out his arms and he says, I agape you. This is a love where I don't want anything in return. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Do you hear the voice of Jesus hanging on the cross with an immense love for us? It's not what is love, it's who is love. And Jesus is love. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. He does not boast and he is not proud. Jesus does not uh, dishonor people. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He's not in heaven keeping a record of wrong. No, Jesus doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. Jesus always protects. Jesus always trusts. Jesus always perseveres because Jesus never fails. Our Jesus never fails. His love for you will never fail. There's no sin that can separate you. He loves you. Your marriage is broken, he loves you. You're alone, he loves you. You're addicted to masturbation, he loves you. You are isolated and fearful, he loves you. And because he loves you, can we worship him with every ounce of our being, with every fiber of faith, can we praise God? We bask in his love and we love him because he first loved us. Can you give God your greatest praise today? Hi, my name is Matt Oltoff, one of the pastors here at the Father's House. Thank you so much for watching our YouTube channel. But don't stop here. Be sure to subscribe below so you don't miss out on a single service. You can also support this ministry by clicking the Give Now button and help us continue reaching and inviting people around the world to discover freedom and life in Jesus. Thank you so much for watching. God bless.